Hello everybody and welcome again to ChessLecture.com. This is International Master Dave Figueredo. Today I'm going to uh, look at a rather old game, um, not too old, but relatively speaking, from uh, current world champion Magnus Carlsen. In this game, I was actually a little surprised that we had never covered it, but it's kind of was in a way like Carlsen's coming out party. He won like a very flashy game that I, I would say is is pretty well known. I remember when this game was played, it was kind of making news because Carlson was only 13 years old. And it might have been uh, around this time that Carlson was, you know, started landing his magazine covers and such. One reason I wanted to show this game, and uh, another time I'll, I'll show another kind of modern Carlson game to also illustrate a point, is I think a lot of people think of Carlson as this kind of boring technician, um, we see, you know, him just kind of playing, you know, any kind of opening, even something very quiet, and with black playing some uh, slow double king pawn openings, and everybody's kind of afraid of him, afraid of him in these positions. So one one striking game to me is a game that he beat Anand in their first world championship match, where he just outplayed him in some quiet double king pawn game that got into some queen and, queen and rook against queen and rook where he'll just keep playing and wait for mistakes so he seems kind of like he's not the most exciting player and I think this is why people are often rooting for these exciting players like uh, Richard Rappert and maybe before him somebody like uh, Alexander Morozevich, Alexei Shirov because it's it's more exciting but I think a lot of people don't realize that Carlsen is more than capable of playing this kind of exciting tactical chess. He's just come to realize that that's not always going to work. Uh, if the opportunity arises, then great. But to beat these guys like Kramnik and Aronian and stuff like that, you can't always just get some kind of wild tactical position. So this game goes back to his youth, as I mentioned, and it is, is quite flashy. So let's take a look. We're not going to worry too much about the opening. It's kind of routine. But he was white. He played e4, c6, Karo Khan. His opponent is, uh, I believe he's a grandmaster. He's not super high rated. His name is Sipka Ernst. And this game was played in a well-known uh, tournament in Viganze. It was called Chorus. Sometimes it's called Tata Steel. So they change the name here and there. But this was like the C group. So right now, there's the A group, which is going to have you know, Carlson, Nakamura, Aronian, uh, Caruana, etc. Then there's a B group and a C group. And what they usually do is if you win, like, the C group, then the next year you're automatically invited to play in the B group. And if you win the B group, you get to play in the A group and such. So this was played in the B group. I'm sorry, in the C group. So it was probably like a mix of, uh, you know, probably, uh, probably three grandmasters and then a mix of, like, uh, international masters, juniors, female players, whatnot. So, Karo Khan, d4, d5, knight c3. Nowadays, e5 is the main move. de, knight e4, bishop f5, knight g3, bishop g6, h4, h6, knight f3, knight d7, h5, bishop h7, bishop d3. Takes, takes, e6, all pretty normal so far. Bishop f4. Uh, at the time, this was kind of the critical move. I remember even when I started looking at this kind of opening, like Bishop f4 was considered critical and Bishop d2 was kind of the quiet alternative. And, and now things are the other way around. It used to be considered that Bishop f4 was strong enough that black would play queen a5, Bishop d2, queen c7. It's really the same position as if white played Bishop d2 and black played queen c7. Nowadays, black is in no rush to put the queen on c7, and it's usually cast on kingside for a sharper game. And that's what happens here, actually. Knight f6. Uh, nowadays, too, a more modern line is to play queen a5 check, but with a different idea after bishop d2. Note that if white plays c3, then casting queenside is kind of off the table because the a-pawn is hanging. So bishop d2 and then bishop b4. And this is a, a modern line. But here, knight f6, castles, bishop e7. And this actually is uh, pretty critical when 
Black is castling kingside it just now. Nowadays, Black doesn't even go into this because he's playing a queen a5 and bishop b4. So knight e4. Uh, also quite typical because if Black castles uh, kingside, White wants to have at least this possibility of moving the g-pawn. The knight on g3 is usually kind of like a little bit of White's problem piece. And now queen a5. So here, uh, castles be like a typical move and then um, maybe even g4 immediately is critical uh, nobody plays these lines with black anymore with the bishop on on f4 but maybe white can even do this and if it takes you know some rook to g1 idea is usually coming up so black played queen a5 knight takes uh, king b1 cover the pawn now castles Knight takes, knight takes, and knight e5 to support g4. So this is not such a rare position um, for the time period, which was back in 2004. Uh, there were other games like around that same time period in this line. Um, and nowadays, black usually just avoids it altogether with the whole queen a5, bishop b4 that I mentioned. But this is an older game, and theory always changes. So here, uh, Carlson, uh, I'm sorry, after rook ad8, which is normal enough, he played queen e2. So this uh, he wants to play g4, but he wants to kind of get his queen off the d-file first. And this also sets up some other ideas. Now, black played c5, which had occurred before, and this is usually kind of what black wants to do. Um, there was another game that I think Anand had against Bereyev where black played uh, queen b6 first, and, uh, which just attacks the d-pawn, and, and then followed with c5. Perhaps white could even play g4 here. And black maybe could throw in like knight d5, but bishop d2, and then uh, g4 will come. If knight b4, then a3. Bishop, if bishop b4, then c3. So this I don't think really helps black so much either. I mean, the typical problem in this this opening is that this g-pawn can be very dangerous because black has played the move h6, which is often called like a, a hook, because once white gets g4, g5 in, you can't avoid some kind of opening of lines. But there's other ways through, too, as we'll see. Because here, black played c5. And uh, this kind of allows a clever tactic, but it's it's not really the end of the world. And it's a, it's a thematic sacrifice. I think already at 13, Carlson had studied so much chess and remembered the ideas that he knows most of the, the typical tactics and positional ideas in almost every opening. He played knight g6. So this is like a cute move. And... Um, and black took the knight, which I think is, is wrong. Um, probably he has to play uh, rook f8, and then knight e7, rook e7, dc. And, okay, this looks kind of uncomfortable, because you can't take on c5, because the rook is hanging. And um, this is also you know, not, not so appealing, I guess. Um, Black maybe could play knight d5 uh, after dc, and then bishop d6, rook d7, and uh, with the idea of b6, um, the you know the bishop looks nice on d6, but Black's going to play b6, and that should even even get him the pawn back. So I'm not going to go so deep into to the theory here, but that's probably the right way for Black to play. If that doesn't work, then he has to go back even further and like not play c5. Because fg, we'll see, does not work. So queen takes e6. So here we see the other idea of queen e2. In this game, white never has to bother with g4 because he's getting uh, an attack with his pieces in. And this sometimes happens in an, in an opening like this. With the opposite castling is you you have to face the attack first. Uh, doesn't always work, but here here it does. So now you can't protect your bishop with rook f7 because just hg will win win back a whole rook. So king h8, and now um, 
a st very strong move, he plays h takes g6. Okay, if he takes on e7, then there's knight d5. So this is kind of an obvious double attack by the knight. It's not um, so bad for white. He's not really losing anything just yet because he can play bishop to d2. And this saves the material. Like, black can't play queen takes d2 because of queen takes f8 check, winning the exchange. But maybe just like knight e7, bishop a5, and you know, b6, or maybe you can even just take on d4, and uh, black is, um, is is probably surviving. It's even material, so maybe white has some advantage, but it's uh, it's certainly much better than what happens in the game. So he plays hg, so already this has um, some big problems. So the, right, the bishop on e7 is is still um, hanging, and you can't really, like, ignore it, because um, let's, here, let's just say you don't care about the bishop on e7, you play a move like c takes d4 at the very least, there's like bini 7 knight d5, and this never works now, because rook h6. And takes and then mate on h7. So you can't really ignore that the bishop is hanging. So okay, you could protect it, let's say rook f8, um, but now this pawn is a, it's obviously like kind of an unwelcome visitor for the black king, and it's not so hard to find uh, some blows. You just keep looking at the sacrifices, so takes, for example, takes, and um, even just queen f7 now, threatening rook h6 mating, and I think um, protecting with the other rook doesn't help. Here you can, um, okay, now f7 is covered. Bishop takes h6 probably still works, but maybe you can even sack the rook takes, takes, bishop takes, and there's still like too many threats here, maybe like rook h1. It seems like it's all losing for black. So he played knight g8. So this this looks pretty sensible because you cover your bishop on e7 and you're kind of trying to overprotect the h6 pawn. But it turns out it's not enough because bishop takes h6 anyway. So now if the knight takes, then you just go takes, 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 and you can't really protect against queen h7 mate. So that doesn't help. So you have to go gh, and then he does basically the same thing, except now he's uh, investing more material. Rook takes, knight takes, and queen takes. So again, threatening queen h7. Um, at least black has a, a move here. He can play knight f7 uh, to, to stop the mate if rook h1. King g7. Okay, it looks very scary for Black's king, but at the moment he's up a rook and a knight, so there's some hope of surviving, and his queen might be able to come back and somehow defend along this rank. So here Carlson played um, played a good move, and in fact, the move this position had occurred before. So I'm not really sure if this is all this sacrificing so far is like just Carlson's uh, tactical ability, although at the very least he uses that to finish off the game, or if he was just so well prepared, like if he saw the previous game and had analyzed it and just kind of knew everything. Because uh, there was a game the year before, where um, which is also winning, uh, queen f6 check, king g8, and then rook h1. So, all right, it threatens... Uh, G takes f7 and rook h8 mate, and if the knight moves, rook h8 is mate right away. Uh, white played queen e7. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, here, black does have a move, knight h6. So this kind of saves him for the moment, because you can't take everything. So then queen to e7, um, threatening queen h7 mate, knight goes back to f7. And uh, here... Uh, white kind of missed the win. Of course, he can play queen f6. Um, it looks like taking on f7 doesn't quite work. Takes note that the rook on d8 is protected. And like if queen e5, rook g7, and 
Black can keep meeting the, the one move mate threats by blocking with his rook, and I guess weight is just having a draw. But instead of taking, there's a move that's it's hard to find over the board, perhaps. Um, but he can play rook h3. And this will be kind of similar uh, to the game. So the idea is to take on f7 and have rook g3. Uh, so this looks um, this looks like it, it should win. There's not really any defense. Like if knight g5, which are right, trying to distract the queen, and it covers h7. But I think then rook h7, threatening queen g7, this is, is winning for white. So that does win, but Carlson found a, a different different way that is, I think, even more convincing. He just took on f7 right away. All right, it looks kind of like an obvious move. but All right, so the first threat is like queen f6 and then rook h1 mate. So... Uh, also threatening maybe like queen e5, so I think if here, queen e5, this also is not really uh, helping black. So he played king g7, rook d3, uh, maybe he can also check first. I think according to the computer, like checking and then takes and rook d3 is, is also winning. So rook d3. And this is this is why the the other position that where white missed rook h3 white similar the idea is to just use the rook along the third rank, and now black probably has to just go like queen b6, and then if rook g3, queen g6, but it's uh, it's it's winning for white of course just takes takes at the very least you can just take here and it's like a queen and four pawns or something. Um, against the two rooks, so that's pretty easy too. He did rook d6, so he still wants to, to block. Rook g3 check. Okay, so now he blocks with a rook. If he oh, if he goes here or here, you'll have a check, like here, then check, and then mate here. Or similarly, if king here. Uh, maybe don't check here, because rook h6, but I think queen e4. And then queen comes to h4 next, so that's a really quick mate. So he blocks rook g6. And uh, here you have to find the right move, which is maybe not so hard. Queen e5 check. And uh, here he just kind of walked into mate. Okay, he can play king h7, queen h5, rook h6. And we have the same kind of mechanism, queen f5 h8, and then queen e5, king h7, and then mate on g7 again. So he goes to f7, and then queen f5 check, and we have a nice kind of, uh, almost like a swallowtail mate. Um, he went here, and then mate. Okay, he can go uh, king e7, it seems too, but this is also very quick mate, I think, like with rook e3, and uh, let's see, Number, he doesn't want him to take this with check, but there's not really anywhere to go to take, we will take one of these with check, so like king d6 or something, or king d8, either way we're taking f8 with check, and, and then we're going to be up a whole bunch of pawns if we're not mating right away. So... Rook f6 with queen d7 mate is kind of a nice finish. Sometimes this is called, I think, uh, it's kind of like a, well, I guess it's not a swallowtail mate. A swallowtail mate would be with the rooks behind the king. It's almost like an epaulette mate, where if we don't even count this file, because the rook covers it, the, the two rooks uh, stop the black king from escaping. So this game, I think, is um, a game that everybody should, uh, you know, have to memorize it, but everyone should be familiar with this, because this is Carlson's, kind of first uh, big flashy victory. He, uh, he had another one that I might show another time against uh, player Dolmatov, who was a former candidate for the world championship. But this one, and I think because of the tournament, because it was the Vikanze tournament, first made a lot of noise and, and got him on the cover of New in Chess. So I hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you next time on ChessLecture.com.